I think that is about it, so we can get started. Um, so, we are super excited to have Alexandre Duran uh, give a talk today on differentiable causal discovery with observational and interventional data. Alexandre is a research scientist at Element AI in Montreal and adjunct professor of computer science at Laval University. He received his PhD in machine learning from Laval University in 2019 for his work on antibiotic resistance prediction in bacterial genomes. His interests include causal inference, deep learning, and bioinformatics. Alexandre, welcome to Oatmeal. Great. Thanks, Andrew, for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. I'm glad to be here today to present our work on differentiable causal discovery. Uh, so this is joint work with my collaborators, uh, Philippe Brouillard, Sébastien Lachapelle, Alexandre Lacoste, and uh, Simon Lacoste-Junier. All right, so my talk will be structured as follows. I will start with a brief introduction to causal inference, and I'm going to use that uh, to motivate the problem of causal discovery. Um, so then I'll present causal discovery, and I will finish with uh, by presenting our recent paper called Differentiable Causal Discovery with Interventional Data. Uh, so feel free to ask questions, as Andrew said. What I'll do is I'll pause at the end of each of these sections, and I'll take any, uh, any questions you may have. All right. So let me start with a really simple example that's taken from the book of Jonas Peters et al. Um, so consider re the relationship between altitude and temperature, okay? And, and I'm going to illustrate the difference between statistical associations and causal relationships. Uh, so let's say you have the altitude of some cities and you also have their average temperature. You know that these two quantities are statistically dependent. So uh, if altitude increases, usually temperature decreases, um, and the opposite, way around, the opposite way around, if altitude uh, increases, then temperature decreases. And you can factorize a joint distribution um, by either taking the conditional of altitude based on temperature or the temperature based on the altitude. It's going to work in both cases. You will be able to predict it. However, you can ask some really simple questions. Sorry, I'm having issues with my slides here. Um, okay, great. So um, will cooling house number one make it climb the mountain? Obviously the answer to that is no, right? If you cool the house, it's not going to climb up the mountain. That's common sense. Um, however, will pushing house number two down the mountain change its temperature? And the answer to that is most likely yes, especially if the mountain is high. Um, and so what you can see is that although you can predict one quantity for the other, they're statistically related, um, only one of the directions that you can use for prediction is actually causal, okay? And why would we care about that? Uh, I'm going to use a very simple example um, to illustrate that. So this is an example of Simpson's paradox. Um, it's actually the classical kidney stone example that you probably have heard of before. So assume that we have data for uh, kid patients with kidney stones and uh, the data is about their recovery. Okay, so we know that some patients uh, have small stones and some patients have large stones. Um, and there are two possible treatments, treatment A or treatment B. So the, the percentages you're seeing here are the actually, actual recovery rates of the patients. Okay, so you can see that for patients with small stones, treatment A seems to lead to a greater chance of recovery. Okay, so 93% of patients with small stones uh, that are given treatment A do a successful recovery. So treatment A seems to be more effective. Now patients with large stones, <clears throat> you see the same thing. So treatment A seems to be more effective, 73% in this case. But now if we look at the full population, we see that treatment B seems to be more effective. Okay, so it reverses our conclusion. Okay, so something's going on that's messing with our statistical analysis. Um, and you'll see what it is in the next slide. But basically, this is an example to illustrate that um, you need to be careful how you do the analysis. Otherwise, you may come to completely reverse conclusions. Great. So what's really going on here is that the size of the stone is acting as a confounder. Okay. So there's a confounding variable S, which is for the size of the stone. And it's affecting both your chances of recovery and the treatment that the doctor will give you. So... For example, if you have uh, smaller kidney stones, you may have a greater chance of recovery, um, but the doctor may also be more likely to assign a specific treatment to you. Okay, so in this case, patients with small stones were more likely to receive treatment B, 
and they were also more likely to, to have a good outcome. Okay, so this confounder is creating uh, bias in the analysis. Okay, so um, it's create it's not actually it's biasing the relationship between the treatment and recovery. So what we really want to do, if we want to reason about the causal effect of the treatment on recovery, is that we want to isolate this blue edge over here. Okay, we want to say what's going to happen to recovery if I give you the treatment, um, irrespective of this bias due to the confounder. And we'll see how we can remove that a little bit later in the talk. Great, so what I'm trying to illustrate is that there are really two different types of questions. You can have non-causal questions and causal questions. So a non-causal question would be, uh, what is the probability of recovery given that the doctor assigned treatment A? And as you can see, you can answer that question using this conditional probability, okay? But the issue here is that you will have this confounding bias due to S, right? So now the causal formulation for this would be, what's the probability of recovery if treatment A is used irrespective of the size of the stones? Okay, and this, yeah, you can write it with this notation. Uh, so probability of R equals one, so successful recovery, given that I make the action of taking treatment A. And what this notation means is that we're actually removing the edges going from S into T, and we're forcing T to take on some value. Okay, so we're basically uh, kicking out the doctor and taking treatment A. Okay, so, and this is an intuitive example. I will formalize that uh, in a second. All right, so, but before I do that, just let me uh, put down some notation and some definitions, and then we'll get back to the definition of what these interventions actually are. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have causal Bayesian networks. This is going to be the framework in which, we, with which we're going to work. Um, we'll have a random vector. So this is just a vector of random variables. We'll have D random variables. We'll also assume that we have a directed acyclic graph where this graph contains one vertex for each random variable. And uh, as opposed to regular Bayesian networks, in causal Bayesian networks, we'll assume that the edges have a, indicate a causal relationship. So if I play with X1, it will affect X2. Um, so if I play with X2, it will affect X3, but it will not affect X1, okay? Because the edges indicate a causal relationship. And just like Bayesian networks, these encode conditional independence constraints uh, via D separation. So for example, um, here X1 and X3 are conditionally independent given X2, okay? Because X2 blocks the path from X1 to X3. All right, and I will see, you will see that in more detail a little bit later. Um, now, what this allows us to do is to, uh, the graph gives us a factorization of the distribution. So P of X, can be written as the product of the conditional distributions of each variable given its causal parents in the graph. This is this pi i j means the parents of um, the variable i in the graph g. All right, so yeah, pi i g is the parents. Okay, so I said one particularity of causal Bayesian networks is that they support interventions. So let me just define this in a bit more details. Um, so as we saw before, we have this observational distribution where we have S, T, and R, um, and S acts as a confounder, which is biasing the relationship between T and R. Okay, so we can write down this distribution as P of S, because there's no parents to S, P of T given S, because it's its only parent, and then P of R given S, T. Okay, so this is the factorization based on the parents that I was just talking about. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, the causal quantity P of R equals one, given that you do treatment A, so given that I take treatment A, irrespective of the size of my stones, uh, is not equal to the conditional probability due to the confounding bias. Great. So what we would really like to do is to reason about the fact that we're taking treatment A and that there is no bias given by S. And what this corresponds to is actually removing all the edges from S into T. Um, this is graphically what it corresponds to. And you may think of doing this by randomizing the assignment of the treatments. So you can say, I'm not gonna consider a doctor anymore. I'm going to assign treatment A to 50% of the population and treatment B to the rest of the population. 
And what this corresponds to is actually taking the same conditional distributions, but replacing the variables, uh, the variable that's under interventions distribution with a marginal distribution. Okay, so here we have the, we had P of T given S because of this edge. Now we're taking this out and replacing it by a marginal distribution for T. Uh, yeah, so randomization is one way to do this. And then in this specific case, when you have a graph that looks like this, you can say that the conditional probability of R equals one given T equals A is equal to the probability of recovery given that you do treatment A. Okay, so this is an intervention. Now, I'm also going to introduce a, a little bit more generalized version of interventions, uh, which are called imperfect interventions. So in perfect interventions, you remove the edges from the causal parents into the variables under intervention, but in imperfect intervention, you're keeping the edges, but you change the conditional distribution. So this is basically like swapping the doctor for another doctor. Um, so let's say uh, the first doctor was assigning treatment B to patients with small stones, then maybe this one is assigning treatment A. Okay, so there is still a, a bias due to the size of the stone, but it can change, right? It, it won't be the same one. Um, now there's something very important that uh, you should notice here. And this is uh, the invariance of the conditional distributions that are not under intervention. Okay, so if you look uh, at those three uh, factorizations, you'll see that we have P of S in each of them and it's the same distribution and also P of R given S and T is also the same, okay? So because the variable is not under intervention. And this is also known as modularity or autonomy of causal mechanisms. Um, and it's something that will be very important in understanding our DCDI method a bit later uh, in the talk. Good. Okay, so I said, you could reason about interventions by doing randomized control trials where you randomly assign treatments to people, but randomization may not always be possible. Uh, so for example, if the treatment is um, removing an arm from someone, you can't say I'm going to randomly assign people to getting their arms removed, right? So you can't do that. So what you would like to do instead is to use observational data, which is data from this bias distribution. So you're just going to go and collect a bunch of data um, from the internet or from uh, medical records. <clears throat> and you want to use this to draw causal conclusions. So you want to use this to estimate causal quantities like probability of recovery given that I take treatment A. So our goal is to go from a distribution like this and to imagine quantities that live more in a distribution like this where there's no bias due to the confounder. So what this task is called on going from an observational quantity to an, actually on translating an, a causal quantity like P of R given do T equals A into a purely statistical quantity. This task is called identification. Um, and you can do this using methods like do calculus uh, by Perl. So there's a set of rules that allow you to automatically translate a causal quantity like this into a purely statistical quantity that you can go and estimate. Um, and what's nice is that do calculus is complete. So if the quantity can be identified, then do calculus will identify it. And you can look at those reference if you want to know more about this. And to give you an example, um, this causal quantity right here at the top, P of R equals one, given that I do treatment A, um, is equal to this, this quantity on the right side, which is, as you can see, it's based only on, uh, conditional distributions, right? So you can estimate that from your observational data and it will, if you estimate it correctly, it will uh, give you uh, the, this causal quantity you are interested in. Okay, so there's many practical implications to estimating quantities like that. I, I'm not going to go into these details. I, I just wanted to present the fact that you may want to use identification to map a causal quantity to uh, a statistical quantity that you can estimate. So this is all nice, but it requires knowing the causal graph. And so what if you don't know the causal graph, right? So there's methods that allow you to, to work with partial causal graphs like IDA. Um, so this is, I think it's an interventional calculus when the DAG is absent. You can use methods like that. Um, but what I want to move to is to causal discovery, okay? So when you don't know the graph, you may try to learn it. 
Okay, and uh, I think now is a good time to pause if there's any questions on, on the intro to causal inference, um, just before I move on to causal discovery. I have a quick question. So yeah. in the distinction between uh, imperfect intervention and perfect intervention, the difference is, okay, so our, our, our P of S stays the same and our PR given ST stays the same. So our, our, our recovery is going to be the same, uh, given the code, well, to S and T. Yeah. So the difference between a perfect intervention and an imperfect intervention is that we're only sort of changing that P of T given S. So it's like either we're, we're a different doctor or it's a different hospital, um, yeah. but it's still, so it's not a, we're not just, we can't just turn off T, turn on or off T by some random mechanism. We've just sort of changed the distribution of T given S, is that is it? Yeah, that's it, that's exactly it. So you cannot change, you cannot go, go and do a randomized control trial, um, but maybe you have data from, um, as you said, many hospitals where you have doctors that are biased in different ways. So they're still biased, just in different ways. Um, and uh, what you could say is that it's the same um, causal underlying causal graph, but there are imperfect interventions in the sense that the probability of which treatment you'll receive given the size of your stones varies by hospital for example. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I have a question from Tom Waddell. Uh, have you ever used causal inference in systems where loops are inherent? Yeah, I, I have not. Um, and this is one assumption that I'll be making in, in the talk that we have, that the, uh, that the underlying uh, data generative process is factorized as a, as a DAG. Okay, so I know there are methods. Uh, I've seen them in textbooks. I'm just not familiar with them. But you, I, I'm sure you can do something when the when the graph is cyclic. Um, but here I'll assume it's not. We have another one from Chris Salvi. Um, are you assuming having full knowledge of the structure of the causal graph, all variables, edges, etc.? Yeah. So th that's a good question. Um, in this present talk, I'm going to move on to causal discovery. So I'll assume that you have all the variables, but I'm going to try to learn the causal structure. Um, so yeah, so if you want to do identify identification, sorry, um, ideally you will have the full causal graph. Um, you can still work when you have partial knowledge of the causal graph. So like this IDA thing I was mentioning, allows you to work when you have a Markov equivalence class for the, uh, for the graph. And I'll explain what this is uh, a little bit later in the talk, but basically you may be able to identify parts of the graph and still say something about a causal quantity. For, for example, bound it or find an interval where it lives. Well, thank, thank you for the okay. questions. I think we can move on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now let's move on to causal discovery. Okay, so as I said, if you don't know the graph, it's hard to do identification and to answer causal questions. So let's see what we can do. Um, actually, the task uh, I'll be focusing on in this presentation is causal discovery. Um, don't pay too much attention to this, the distinction between these two types of data for now. The thing that's important to understand is that we're going to take in some data, which are observations from the system, and we'll want to pass this into an algorithm that is going to output a graph structure which ideally will be the structure of the underlying causal graph. So common assumptions. So this is where the DAG part comes in. So, so to, make, to make this possible, we need to make assumptions. Okay, we can't just learn any type of graph. Uh, we need to make some assumptions, uh, some of them which are pretty strong. For example, this causal sufficiency assumption means that there's no hidden confounding variables. So if you remember, the S variable, the size of the stone on top of the other ones was acting as a confounder. And we're going to assume that there are no such variables that we do not observe. So it's fine if there are confounders, but just no hidden confounders. All right. So this is called causal sufficiency. And then we're going to make two very important assumptions. The first one is the Markov property. And it's equivalent to saying that there is a DAG uh, that, the, that the underlying data generative process factorizes as a DAG. So what, what the Markov property says is that the separation in the graph implies conditional independence. Okay, so if two variables, if all the paths between two variables are blocked by some set of variables Z in the graph, 
is going to mean that they will be independent, conditionally independent in the distribution. And there's also the faithfulness assumption, which is basically the other way that uh, if two variables are conditionally independent in the data, it implies a deseparation in the graph. Okay, so this is the other way around. And what these two assumptions guarantee is that um, properties of the data reveal properties of the graph and, and the other way around as well. Okay, so it means we can actually have a method that uses, for example, the likelihood of the data, and it will reveal something about the graph for us. Okay, so this ties them together. Um, so there's a set of methods for causal discovery that relies on conditional independence testing. And the rationale is that um, if you have a conditional independence, it implies the separation in the graph. Um, in the context of this talk, I'll be focusing on another type of method. Um, and by the way, to give you an example, a method based on conditional independence would be, for example, the PC algorithm, which is very classic. Okay, but in this talk, I'll be focusing on score-based causal discovery, um, which is just a different type of method to achieve the same thing. So the idea is to find the DAG that maximizes a score function S. Okay, so for example, this score function could be the data likelihood plus a sparsity prior on the graph. So uh, it's, this is, uh, you can see this in this equation uh, like more clearly. So we're going to be looking for the estimator graph. So this is G hat, um, which is the argmax over the space of every possible DAG of the score. So we just want to find the DAG that maximizes some score. Um, and obviously you can't use any arbitrary score here. Uh, one of the challenges in score-based causal discovery is to demonstrate that the score will lead to the true solution. Okay, so you need to show that maximizing this score will lead you somewhere near the true graph. Okay, and this can be challenging. And another challenge of this setup is that the search space is super exponential with the number of variables. Okay, so this kind of table and figure at the same time, you should only pay attention to the, the shape of it. Um, this is the number of DAGs with P nodes. So if you have one node, there is one DAG. Uh, and then if you have 20 nodes, then there is this number, which I cannot even pronounce. Okay, this is the space of every, this is the solution space basically. Um, and it grows super exponentially with the number of variables. So a big challenge in score-based causal discovery is finding an efficient way to filter and search through this set of DAGs to identify the true one. Okay, and this, so this is a really, um, big computational problem actually. And so there's been a few solutions proposed for that. Um, one that's well known is the greedy equivalent search, um, which is basically a greedy algorithm for uh, score-based causal discovery. Um, and yeah, so it uses a greedy algorithm to efficiently browse this uh, large space of possible DAGs. Um, there has been a recent paper called DAG with no tears that, uh, that proposes to use continuous constrained optimization to search uh, the space of DAGs. And this is exactly what our work will be based on. Okay, so this continuous constrained optimization search of the space of possible DAGs. Great, and we'll get back to that when I present the CDI, our, our algorithm. So even with all those assumptions, even if you have a perfect score-based causal discovery algorithm, there's another challenge, and this is that you can only identify the true causal graph up to its Markov equivalence class. Okay, so without getting into details, what this means is that if you have observational data, you apply a causal discovery algorithm, even if it's the best causal discovery algorithm, you'll converge to a set of DAGs that are equivalent to the actual DAG. Okay, so in this figure, I'm showing um, the true DAG with this target, and maybe in the Markov equivalence class, uh, you have three other DAGs, okay? Um, and you can see that these DAGs share some yellow edges in common, and then the other edges, the black ones, can be oriented in different ways. Um, but in terms of observational data, these graphs are all equivalent. We would not be able to, to tell them apart. Um, so a big challenge is to say, can I shrink the equivalence class? And ideally, can I identify exactly the true DAG by having an equivalence class that contains only a single element. So there's many ways to do that. So in, uh, in the past, people have shown that you can use um, functional form assumptions on the, on, the, on the conditional distributions. 
So you can say that there is a structural equation that's nonlinear with additive noise that maps parents to their, ch their child variables. Um, and in this case, you can identify the causal graph. Here, we're going to take a different approach. Um, so we're going to use interventions. So it's been shown that you um, can, if you have interventional data, which means that you, you observe the system um, but when you make an experiment on some variables. So, so let me clarify that. The Markov equivalence would be correspond to, uh, you can get from observational data. So observational data means that you would look at your system. You have an underlying system, which you don't understand. You want to understand what causes what, um, and you just passively look at the system and you collect data about the state of all variables. This would be the observational data and it gives you the Markov equivalence class. Now, let's say I, I make an experiment. So I have a button in my system, I push it, and then uh, I look at the system again and I collect data when this button has been pushed. And then I push another button and I, I, I do this again, okay? So this will give me interventional data and with interventional data, you can identify a interventional Markov equivalence class, um, which has a nice property of being a subset of the Markov equivalence class. And the more interventions you have, the, the smaller this I Markov equivalence class becomes. And uh, in the limit where you have one intervention, um, in the limit where you can observe uh, in a different context, each variable under intervention, uh, you will identify the true graph. So in, in what this means is that the Markov equivalence class for interventions will contain a single element. All right, and this has been shown uh, in this paper, for example, by uh, Eberhard et al. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's also a nice result that says, um, in some cases, you may need log of the number of variable interventions. Okay, so, but the take home is that if you increase the number of interventions, you increase the, you, you decrease the size of the Markov equivalence class and you get closer to the true graph. Okay, so you may say like in practice, how may I collect such data? Uh, so I, I want to give you an example from biology, for example. Um, and the reference is here if you want to know more. But basically, you can perform gene knockout. If you have gene expression data, you can try and knock out some genes or knock them down. Um, what a knockout means is that you will inhibit the uh, expression of a gene, and then you will uh, collect data on where, uh, in a setting where this gene has zero expression. OK, so you could say, I have a, a system of genes. I look at their expression. Then I'm going to make an experiment, uh, an intervention, where I knock out one gene, it has zero expression, and then I collect more data. And then I'll knock out another gene and, and so on. OK, and if you're doing this, you're making experiments, and you're also collecting interventional data. Great, so um, now I'm ready to move on to our main contribution. So it's a good time to stop and take some more questions. Okay, we have, we have. a question from Alex. Um, is it possible to, uh, is it possible with score-based methods to find a scoring that gives different scores to DAGs in the same Markov equivalence class? For example, indicate which are more plausible explanations for observational data. I've been asking it to myself actually in the past weeks. Um, so I, I don't have a solid answer for that. Um, I know that technically all the graphs in the Markov equivalence class, you will have a hard time telling them apart based on your score. Like they will have the same score. Okay. And so this is why they're in the Markov equivalence class. But if you make additional assumptions, um, maybe some, some of these graphs will become more plausible. Um, to give you like a very extreme example, um, you could say that all the causal relationships are uh, nonlinear functions with additive noise. And in this case, um, you, if you don't make that assumption, you will converge to some Markov equivalence class. And then when you make this assumption, there's only a single graph in the Markov equivalence class that will make sense. Okay, all the other graphs will violate this assumption. So this is a, an extreme assumption because it, it, it kicks out all the other graphs. But if you make some kind of softer assumption, uh, then probably you can weigh the graphs in the equivalence class by preference. Cool. Um, I have another question from Jean-Francois. Um, do you, could, you, could you sort of give more intuition or examples for Markov equivalence? So, well, I could, I could give you um, 
yeah, so let's try to give an example for that. Um, in this case, so the definition of Markov equivalence class is that all the graphs in the Markov equivalence class will share the same skeleton and the same V structures. Okay, if you look at, this is the graphical definition. Um, and so you can represent a Markov equivalence class with a CP DAG, which is this thing I, I'm circling with my cursor right now. Um, so there are some directed edges, for example, these yellow ones, because uh, these two variables form a V structure. So it has to be in, in the, all the graphs in the Markov equivalence class have to have it. Okay, and this edge going from this variable to the other um, is directed to because if it was reversed, uh, it would create a new V structure. So it, it would not be in the Markov equivalence class. Okay, so um, to give you an example, um, so I have a hard time trying to think of an example, but um, it, it tells you something about the conditional independences in the data. Um, and it tells you that for in some cases, you just cannot determine the direction of the edge. So for example, um, this is the true graph, but as you can see, um, for example, this one on the top is the same graph. I oh, know it's, yeah, it's the same graph, but you've reversed this vertical edge right here. So it kind of encodes the impossibility to tell the direction of one edge apart from the other based on the evidence that you have in the data. That's the uh, bit more detailed explanation I could give you. So would those two graphs have the same score, you generally using a score-based method? Markov equivalence class, they would have the same score because we just, so even if your score is consistent, even if you demonstrated this property, um, you cannot tell these graphs apart. Okay, so they will have the <clears throat> they will have the same score. Um, yeah, according to your method, you just won't be able to tell them apart. And this is why we would like to consider interventions because it just shrinks the set of graphs that are equivalent. Cool. Cool. I hope this clarifies. I uh, I might. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correctly, but I, I will try. And I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong. But Odran Odran has a question. Do these causal discovery methods have the ability to support noise terms representing causal features we have yet to discover? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, not confounders. Not So in, in my case here, we're making the assumption that there are no hidden confounders. So you could not have a variable that's uh, like a, a hat on top of two other variables that's pointing downwards towards two variables. Um, but if let's say you have a set of variables and then for one variable, there is an actual unseen variable that's pointing into it. Um, this can be seen, this can be uh, like englobed in the noise of that variable, right? So um, you don't observe that value. Um, and in practice, in real life, we, just, we don't observe everything. There's randomness that's due to not observing things, right? So there, you have this variable of interest. There may be many variables that, that cause it, but you'll say this is a noise distribution because I just don't know how to explain it. Okay, so, so this is my intuition on that. <coughs> I think that is all the questions we have for now. Cool. So now um, I will move on to our, our, our actual algorithm. Um, which is called differentiable causal discovery with interventional data. Um, so this was published at NeurIPS uh, 2020, so the, the past edition of NeurIPS. Um, and so I, I, I made this fact sheet uh, to make it clear exactly what DCDI is, DCDI for differentiable causal discovery with interventions. Um, so DCDI is a score-based causal discovery method. So as I, it's the same kind of method as I just presented. Its search strategy is based on continuous constraint optimization, just like in the DAG with no tears paper. Okay, so I showed you two different ways. There was this greedy search and there was the continuous optimization, optimization search. We're going to be using this uh, the conditional, um, sorry, continuous constraint optimization approach. Um, the data that DCDI supports can be both observational and interventional, and the interventions can be both perfect and imperfect. Okay, as I presented before, um, and I told you one of the big challenges was to show the consistency of a score if you're going to make a score-based method. 
Um, and we do have this theoretical guarantee for DCDI. And I'll introduce it a little bit later. OK, so this is a summary of what DCDI is. Now, before I get into the details, I just want to recap this property, this invariance property of interventional distributions, because it's going to be fundamental to, to, not, to, to actually parsing what you see when I show you the, the loss function of DCDI. So when we have observational data okay, for these four variables, it means that no variable is under intervention. This is what I show in the blue squares. So this is an empty set. No variable is under intervention. And I can sample data, I can sample x's from this distribution. Now I can also make an experiment. Actually, before we go there, um, this is the factorization, right? So we have P1, this is a joint P1, is given by this factorization based on the causal parents in the graph. Now I can go and collect experimental data, so interventional data, where uh, I use this hammer to show that I'm intervening on x2. Okay, so you see that there is x2 in this set of variables under intervention, uh, and I could collect data from this distribution. And what it corresponds to is actually just taking the observational distributions. So you see I'm using the superscript one over here and over here as well, but I'm swapping one of the distributions for the pink one. Okay, so this becomes P2 of x2 given its parents because P2, because variable two, sorry, is under intervention in the second distribution. Good. Now, if I, I can go and make another intervention uh, on variables one and four, for example, this time. So I'm making an experiment on the two variables at the same time. Um, and what this corresponds to is replacing uh, the terms again for, for by new ones, but keeping the ones that were in the observational distribution for all variables that are not under intervention. So for example, these two that I show in black remain the same as in the observational distribution. Okay, so this is invariance. And the general formula for this, which looks a lot like the last function of DCDI, you'll see, is that if a variable is not under intervention, so if a variable uh, J is not in the set IK, find here, for example, um, I will use the observational conditionals. And if a variable is inside the interventional set, so if there is an intervention on that variable in density uh, number k, I will use a special conditional distribution for it that's specific to that intervention. Good, so this is the general formula for what I was just explaining uh, with these examples. Good, okay, so now, just before getting into the details of DCDI, I also want to introduce a few variables that uh, you'll see in the coming slides. So we're going to use uh, G to denote the adjacency matrix of the causal DAG. So um, this is a D by D matrix if we have D variables. Um, and so it's a binary matrix. So if there is a zero, it means there is no edge between the variables. If there's a one, it means that there is an edge. Okay, so this is just a binary adjacency matrix. Um, we're going to assume that we have K potentially imperfect interventions because an imperfect intervention is strictly more general than a, than a perfect intervention. So we'll just work with imperfect ones, um, but the method applies to, to both of them. So we'll assume that we have K interventions, um, which can target multiple variables simultaneously. And we'll define this I matrix, which tells us in each interventional context. So there are K interventional contexts and there are D variables. Um, it will tell us in each context which variable is under intervention. So for example, in context number one, we have observational data because no variable is under intervention. Now, in context number two, uh, we have two variables under intervention. Uh, so the second variable and the third one. Uh, and I use this pink color so you can um, recall that we're actually using special conditional distribution for these because they're under intervention. Okay, so we have this intervention matrix. It tells us um, for each set of data, what were the conditions under which it was collected. Okay, so here's the model architecture of DCDI. We, uh, we're going to use the adjacency matrix of the graph as a mask, and we're going, to, we're going to use it to filter out some variables that are not causal parents of each variable. So let's take this X vector over here, it has one entry for each of the random variables. Um, and we can take uh, columns of the adjacency matrix 
and uh, multiply this element wise by X. And this is going to filter out some variables. Then we feed this into a neural network, one for each actual uh, random variable. And we're going to use this to estimate its likelihood. So we take X, we multiply it by a mask. We give this to a, a specific neural network for each variable. It has different set of parameters um, and it outputs the likelihood, the log likelihood. Okay, and F tilde is, uh, is some density approximator. Good, um, and so the joint likelihood in one interventional setting, so in one interventional density, uh, indexed by K again, just like I was doing in the past slides, um, is given by the product of all conditional distributions. But um, as you can see, the interventional uh, matrix I, which tells you what's under intervention, is branching between either observational parameters or interventional parameters. Okay, just like uh, this general equation I was showing you for interventional distributions uh, two slides ago. Okay, so to recap, we have input variables that are filtered by the graph, but whatever we think is the graph at that moment. Um, and then the parameters we use to calculate the likelihood are determined by the fact that, it's, uh, that this conditional is under intervention or not. Okay, and this gives us the joint likelihood and then we suggest maximizing the following score. So for a DAG G, we're going to take the supremum over all possible parameters phi of the log likelihood in every uh, interventional distribution, which is given by the equation on the previous slide, um, minus a sparsity regularization term. And this corresponds to saying the causal graph is more likely to be sparse than not. Okay, so it's not likely to be a super dense a graph where everything causes everything. Okay, so, so this is nice, but it's still a discrete search problem, right? So in fact, we still have G as input and you need to know G in order to be able to evaluate the score. So the job that remains to be done is to uh, transform this discrete search over graphs into a continuous constraint optimization problem uh, as proposed in the DAG with no tears paper. So before I show you that, I just want to give you the theoretical justification for using this score. Okay, so as I said, um, if you're going to make a score-based causal discovery method, you need to, to justify that this score makes sense. Um, and so we actually have this kind of result in our case. So I assume that uh, G star is the ground truth DAG, I star is the ground truth intervention matrix. So it's the actual, um, so you know the interventions that were made in each context in each interventional distribution. Um, and G hat is the estimator that you get by maximizing our score. So we have a theorem that shows that under a bunch of conditions, one of, one of them uh, is that uh, the density estimator you use uh, to estimate the likelihood has enough capacity. So you need to have enough capacity to express a distribution. Um, if each variable is, under, uh, is individually targeted by an intervention, we get that our estimated graph will be equal to the true graph, okay? There's more assumptions like interventional faithfulness, which is a generalization of that faithfulness property I showed before to interventions. Um, these definitions are really complicated and, and not necessarily intuitive. So I recommend you see the, the paper in the appendix. We define everything uh, and all the assumptions in more details. But the takeaway is that um, basically if the model has enough capacity and if you have enough data, uh, right? So if you have uh, in the limit of infinite data, you will identify the true graph. So this is an identification result. Um, and so it relies on the fact that you have individually targeted each variable with an intervention. And so in, in this specific case, you will identify the graph. But if you do not have one intervention for each variable, um, we show that you will find the interventional Markov equivalence class of the graph. Okay, so this may contain more than one graph. You may not identify the exact true graph, but you will find something that is smaller than the regular Markov equivalence class, uh, which we call, we don't call it, which is called the uh, um, interventional Markov equivalence class. And, and you can look at this paper if you want more details on what this is. Um, but yeah, so, so, so that's it. So we have this kind of result. Um, and so as you can see, the more interventions we see, the closer we get to the true graph. And this result is nice because it tells us that the score we optimize is actually justified. Good. So 
Now that we know our score is justified, we still need to transform it into a continuous optimization problem uh, because right now it's a discrete search problem over the space of DAGs. So let me show you how we do this. Um, we're actually, so we have this uh, discrete problem with G here. We're going to uh, say that the edges of G are sampled according to a Bernoulli distribution with parameters lambda ij. Okay, so the edge ij is sampled uh, from this distribution where uh, this is a sigma is a sigmoid function. Good, so now we have this new score, um, which is the same thing, but we replace G with this lambda thing. Um, and we're going to be taking the expected score, so the expected like uh, likelihood and minus the, the, the sparsity penalty for every graph that we can sample from this distribution. Okay, now the, the last issue is that lambda has absolutely no constraint, it can learn uh, graphs that are definitely not uh, directed and acyclic. So we use the work uh, of DAG with no tiers um, to actually optimize lambda under an acyclicity constraint that will guarantee that any graph you'll sample from this distribution will be a DAG. And uh, they propose this nice constraint that you can add to the optimization problem. And if it's satisfied, you're guaranteed that uh, all the graphs will sample will be directed acyclic graph. Um, and I encourage you to go look at their paper. Uh, they explain this and it becomes very intuitive um, that if this is satisfied, then uh, necessarily there are no cycles in the graph. So this is the score we optimize. Uh, in practice, it looks like this. We're taking um, the max of the over the parameters of the density estimators of the graph. Um, and we're estimating this subject to an acyclicity constraint given by the DAG with no tears paper. To optimize this, we use the augmented Lagrangian method as proposed uh, in DAG with no tiers uh, and RMS prop. So the setup is the same as in La Chapelle et al 2020. You can look at this reference to get more details. Um, and you may have noticed that this involves uh, discrete sampling. So we want to sample uh, the direction of edges. This is a discrete choice. Um, and to get a gradient for this, we use a Gumbel softmax straight through estimator um, from these references here. Uh, basically, what it allows us to do is to, in the forward pass, we make discrete choices, but we can still get a gradient and do back propagation. We do this via this type of uh, estimation. Great. And just as a side note, masks and the Gumbel softmax estimator had been used before in causal discovery, uh, in differentiable causal discovery as well. For example, in the SAM paper uh, of Divian Karinatan. Um, yeah, so, so that's it. These are references you can go and take a look at if you want to know more about this type of method for causal discovery. Okay, so now um, <clears> the <throat> first result I want to show you um, is, is actually a nice, is, so it's just a nice illustration of continuous optimization for structure learning. Um, what you see on the x-axis is the number of gradient steps. What you see on the y-axis is the probability of the edges. Okay, and each, um, each line here is the probability of one edge and the correct edges are shown in green and the wrong ones are shown in, uh, in red. So as you can see, as optimization progresses and as the acyclicity constraint becomes more and more important, uh, edges will be polarized to either zero probability or one probability. Um, as you can see, like this, these green edges over here, the model was not sure and then uh, it decided it was a causal edge at some point, right? So you can see that, um, there is this search over the space of, of, of graphs that's happening uh, via continuous op, um, optimization. And, and gradually, in this case, um, our objective is pruning anti-causal edges. And you can see that they're being clipped at to zero over here. And we make one mistake in this case, this green edge is clipped to zero as well. Okay, so this is what's going on for structured learning with continuous optimization. Um, now, <clears throat> before I just show you a comparison to other algorithms, I want to point out something else about the CDI, and it's the fact that until now, we assumed that the interventional distributions were, were known. So uh, we knew which variables were targeted by interventions, and what if we don't know them, uh, as in the K et al paper, um, we can actually go and learn which variables are under intervention, okay? Um, I, won't, I see we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll go fast on that. But what, what's going on is that we can replace uh, we can actually parameterize the interventional matrix by a Bernoulli distribution in the same way we, we did for the graph. Uh, and we can optimize jointly for all these parameters. 
Um, and we have a theoretical result in the paper that shows that the same guarantee holds for the score. So if we have in the, in the same, with the same assumptions, um, if we have this score over the graph and the interventions, uh, the optimal graph, so the, the maximizers will be the true graph if we have one intervention per, uh, per variable and it will be the true intervention matrix. So we're able to go and identify which variables were intervened on, even though we don't know. So you may just know this data was from one setting, this data was from another setting, and you don't exactly know what's going on in terms of intervention. Good, and for the density functions that we use, we consider two types, uh, a Gaussian one, um, where we basically just predict the mean and the variance of the Gaussian. Uh, so this corresponds to making a nonlinear plus additive noise assumption on the functional form of the causal mechanisms. I, and I told you before that in this case, you're guaranteed to have identification if it actually holds in the data. Um, so this is one formulation of DCDI. And we also consider deep sigmoidal flows, uh, which are a type of normalizing flows that were shown to be universal density approximators in this paper. So what this means is that in the, in the Gaussian case, we're making a strong assumption on the functional forms and the data, but in the second case, we're not. We're just saying, uh, try to approximate this distribution without putting strong constraints on it. Um, but in the case of DCDI, it's fine. We can still do it because our theorem one guarantees that with enough interventions, we will identify the true graph. So because of these interventions, our method does not necessarily need to make uh, Gaussian, like a, a nonlinear positive noise assumption. Uh, on the causal mechanisms. All right, and so um, this is the last result slide that I have. Um, here, I'm going to show you a comparison of DCDI G, which is the Gaussian density one, and DCDI DSF, which is the deep sigmoidal flow version, um, on a bunch of data sets, uh, which are simulated data sets here, uh, because in practice, it's kind of difficult to get the true graph for, uh, for real data. Uh, we don't necessarily know what the causal graph is. Uh, so we use simulated data in this case. Um, there's different kinds of data sets. One that is linear, so the causal relationships are linear and there's additive noise, additive Gaussian noise on it. Uh, we have A and M, which means additive noise models. So the relationships are nonlinear with additive noise. And then there's this nonlinear one um, where each variable is a function of its parents and some noise, but then uh, we use a randomly sampled neural network uh, for the causal mechanisms. So this is just more complex uh, relationships between the variables. And we consider different kinds of connectivities in the graph. E is the average number of parents um, for each variable. So uh, we'll consider E equals one and E equals four. This means, for example, that there are four parents on average for each variable. Uh, the takeaway from this figure is that um, the DCDI methods um, outperform the other methods in terms of structural hamming distance uh, which is just a number of incorrect edges, so lower is better. Um, so they outperform uh, some state-of-the-art methods for SHD, um, when, especially in denser graphs. Okay, so if you look at e equal four graph, you'll see a big difference between our method um, and IGSP, GIES, and CAM, for example. Um, in the linear case, it's doing well. Uh, sorry, in the um, low density ones, it's doing well. Um, but not necessarily as well as in the high density ones. So this was results for known target interventions. So you know what was under intervention. And as I said, it still works for unknown targets when we actually don't know which variables were targeted by interventions. Um, and the same conclusion comes up over here. Um, yeah, so we see that our method is achieving lower SHDs on data sets, especially with uh, higher density. And this was for 20 nodes. Good. All right, so um, uh, here we are at the conclusion. So we've proposed DCDI, which is a method that is theoretically grounded for causal discovery. Um, it supports perfect, imperfect, and unknown target interventions. Uh, it scales well with sample size compared to some methods based on uh, kernel-based independence tests, for example, uh, because we use basically mini batches and we train it using stochastic gradient descent instead of doing independence tests. Um, it achieves state-of-the-art performance, as I just showed you, uh, especially on denser graphs. Um, and so I just want to point out a few uh, future directions. Um, I would like to see and to, to actually try a more extensive evaluation beyond synthetic data, 
um, where the assumptions may be violated. Because in the results I just showed you, um, we designed the data sets, right? But then we, we did a fair benchmark for all the other methods, but still it, it's us that generated the data. We know what the, what's the type of functional relationships. We know that there are no hidden confounders. Um, so actually there's some work in this direction, for example, this paper. Um, and in the future, I plan to go and try uh, our method beyond synthetic data. I think that's really important. Uh, so I, I would like to relax the causal sufficiency um, assumption that we make. So allow for hidden confounders. And in fact, there was this paper that came out very shortly after ours, which is called Differentiable Causal Discovery Under Unmeasured Confounding. And I think this is super relevant. Um, and I would like to, to, to try to merge them with our method, actually. Um, I would like to work on an extension to time series uh, where I believe non-stationarities in the data generating process can act as imperfect interventions with probably unknown targets. Okay, so you may know that something changed in the data, but you don't know what. And so you could try to exploit this to learn the causal structure. And finally, uh, this last project, uh, which I've been actively working on for the past months, is to learn variable representations. Um, what I mean here is to not be agnostic to the nature of the variables, just not to say this is x1, this is x2, uh, and x3, but to try to, to reason by analogy and say this is x1, it's similar to x2, um, based on additional information that you may have, and use this to uncover the causal structure. Um, so with that, thank you a lot for your attention. Uh, and I would like to thank my collaborators again, especially Philippe Bouillard and Sébastien Lachapelle, who did uh, some of the slides that I showed today. Uh, and if you would like to, to try the CDI, you can go look at our GitHub repo over here, and you can always contact me on either email or Twitter at these addresses. And thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Um, we have a few questions. Uh, I just want to remind people that if you'd like to ask in your own voice, please raise your hand. I just have a really dumb question to, to start off with, which I probably missed. Um, so we have our, our adjacency matrix, which is saying uh, edge between these two variables, no edge between these two variables, our intervention matrix, which is saying um, 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 was, or I would say, is this relationship, I guess, from an intervention, some uh, experimental data or observational data? What encodes the direction of the edge? So the, what, the thing that encodes the direction of the edge is that um, this matrix will not be symmetric. Uh, so, yeah. so and, and this is what the acyclicity constraint does actually. So uh, let me get back to that. Okay. So the matrix exponential <clears throat> is actually going to consider um, cycles of length one to infinity. And it's going to, uh, so, you know, if you take the adjacency matrix and you multiply it by itself on the diagonal, you'll have the number of cycles of length uh, two or one. I'm not, I'm not sure, but you can do this many times and it, the diagonal is informative of the number of cycles. Um, and this is what this acyclicity constraint is exploiting over here. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, go to Lode. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk, Lode. Um, I believe you should be able to ask your question now. Hi, sorry. Um, it's quite a long question on that acyclicity constraint. Um, and I want to ask that, so as you're optimizing the graph structure, you might come across some different DAGs that are in the same Markov equivalence classes. Um, do you think there might be some way to relax that acyclicity constraint to allow for you to get some rough idea of where the graph is with some undirected edges while optimizing? and then eventually refine those undirected edges to point in the correct direction. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a really good question. Actually, you, you point out something important and that's that we identify only a single graph, whereas um, we can only identify the Markov equivalence class. So <clears throat> I know that from, from the graph we find, we can recover the Markov equivalence class. So once we've identified the graph, we could say, Here's the graph we found. And by the way, here are the equivalent graphs. Um, I'm not sure what would happen to our theoretical result if you tried to, uh, to integrate this notion of equivalence like within the search. Um, so something I've been curious about is to say, like, can, can, we, um, can we actually learn a Markov equivalence class instead of learning a single graph? And, I stopped at the conclusion that you could recover the equivalence class from the DAG, but yeah, it's possible you can integrate that into the search. 
interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions from Arno. So first is, what is the ground truth intervention matrix? And what happens if the ground truth causal structure is not strictly acyclic, if there are two variables that causally influence each other? So, so to answer the, <clears throat> the last question first, um, if the, the graph is not acyclic, then our theoretical result does not hold. Uh, and we'll probably, uh, so we'll converge to a DAG for sure because of this acyclicity constraint. And so if, if the graph is, is cyclic, well, we just will not uh, recover the right graph. Um, yeah, so, so this is really limited to directed acyclic graphs, especially since we use this acyclicity constraint on the solution that we return. Um, now, in terms of the ground truth interventional matrix, um, it corresponds to, so as we saw here, it's this binary matrix that tells you in each context what was under intervention. Um, to illustrate this a bit more, you can see it as, it, as an equivalent to this set uh, that I was showing in blue over here. So in this context, I know that X2 was under intervention. So I would have a one for this variable and a zero for the other, for the other ones. Uh, and here, for example, I would have two ones in this uh, intervention matrix and I have a zero for the other ones. Um, and so what we call it, we call it the ground truth interventional matrix, because um, as I showed later on in the talk, sometimes you may not know what was targeted by an, uh, by, uh, by an intervention. So you may know that these three distributions are different, that they have different interventions, but you may not know exactly which nodes were targeted by the intervention. Um, and so this is what we call the ground truth is the actual underlying set of interventions. Awesome, thank you. So we're gonna take two more questions and then we have to sort of move on to our next uh, meeting. Uh, one from Benji and one from Alex. So ben, Benji's question is, does the efficiency of the algorithm differ depending on what kinds of imperfect interventions are applied? So um, as you can see, so the, yeah, so as you can see here, there, we have an interventional parameter for each uh, interventional context. Okay, so each row in this I matrix. So, um, or each interventional density, it's, it's the same thing. So for each variable, we'll have a specific set of parameters that apply to this context, okay, that you can activate in the distribution number K for parameter uh, J. So what's going to happen is that if you have, for example, um, many, many uh, uh, interventional distributions, you'll have more and more of these parameters. Okay, so if you, if you say in terms of memory efficiency, for example, um, you, you will just have more parameters to train. Um, it grows linearly with the number of interventional contexts that you have. Um, right, so, and I believe this also affects your computational com um, complexity. It, it affects the, the computational time it will take to do a forward pass and a backward pass because you'll just have more operations to make. Um, but then it does not differ based on the type of imperfect intervention. Um, it especially differs based on the number of interventional contexts that you have. Uh, and Benji, I saw your hand was up there for a second. Would you like to uh, follow up on that? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask that actually um, in terms of um, you know, the type of imperfect intervention, because obviously perfect intervention is a type of imperfect intervention and you can have different uh, distributions. I was just wondering whether uh, maybe certain ones were more conducive to, to, to sort of um, how quickly this, this, this converges, but yeah, I, maybe it doesn't affect it. Actually, you make me think that <clears throat> in the case of perfect interventions, we don't even need to model these uh, conditional densities. Right, so uh, we, we mentioned that in the paper at some point. Um, if, the, if you're looking at perfect interventions, which are just marginals on the variables, um, you, you don't need to model the conditional distribution given the parents because there's no parents. And we actually show that you can drop it in the objective in the paper. Um, so I don't remember exactly where this is, but you could say then that it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit more efficient in the sense that you don't need to all allocate specific parameters for the interventional distribution. Um, yeah, you can see that in section 3.1 of the paper. We say a, a score for, imp oh no, actually that's not the other one. 
let's not it. Um, actually, I can find it for you if you're interested, but it's in the paper. Yeah, so. I can have a look at the paper. Um, yeah, thanks. We can, uh, we can talk by email if, you, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we'll finish off then with a question from Alex. Alex, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so my question was about uh, where the, um, the sparsity regularization comes from. Um, so is it more of a conceptual thing because you, 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 you believe these causal structures will be more sparse, so you want to get sparser graphs out, or is it more of a practical consideration, say, to make the optimizer converge faster, or is it kind of a combination of both? Going back to the theoretical result, it's actually, um, it's not just a practical consideration. It, it intervenes in the, oops, it intervenes in the proof um, of consistency. Um, one of the conditions, <clears throat> one of the assumptions that you need is that this lambda coefficient will be small enough uh, and what small enough means is defined in the paper. We derive some kind of bound for it. Um, but yeah, so you, you need this regularizing, um, you need this sparsity penalty in order to get the identification result. Um, to understand why exactly in details, you can look at the proof for theorem one in the paper um, and it should be explicit. So it needs to be small, but non-zero for this to, to go through. Is that the point? Um, if I remember correctly, this will act as some kind of tiebreaker between two structures that may have just additional edges. So you can still encode the same independencies, but have false positive edges, for example. And this regularizer will allow to just say that uh, this edge is not present in the true graph. So this is the intuition. If you want, uh, in the paper, we give the exact uh, justification and uh, the, some bound on this value. Okay, thanks. Awesome, okay, I think we are going to cut it off there. Um, thank you very much, Alexandre, uh, for, uh, for presenting today. It was a really, really great talk and lots of interaction. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. So now we're going to move over to the other meeting, but I need to